Good afternoon and welcome to our Monticello live stream. Today is election day in the United States and today we are joined by Thomas Jefferson as portrayed by Bill Barker and he's going to be talking about elections. Let us know where you're joining from and please leave any questions that you have in the comments. Well, good afternoon, citizens. My pleasure to be in your company once more, and particularly uh, to have you visit at our Monticello. I beg your pardon if you feel you have um, come across me here uh, deciding uh, how far I will go to imbibe, no, not a glass of cider. Rather, uh, this is a glass of bumbo, whiskey, the draw to the ballot box. Yes, that is what I was reflecting upon uh, here on what you are considering is election day, your election day. And when I was a young man and for many, many years uh, onward, the amount of whiskey that could be provided at the electioneering location, usually a courthouse, uh, was determined by the a number of people who will partake of, well, what is um, a necessity in farming that helps to level off such a dependency on the vagaries of seasons and the crops. Distilling. Distilling is what a farmer may look upon as being able to offer throughout the entire year, and that is why I was so opposed to the whiskey tax. What an encumbrance upon the the farmer, oh, many of the large distilleries in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia could afford to pay the tax, but not the farmer. And many understood that as, uh, as they would pursue their electioneering on voting day. Well, allow me to take a seat, if you will, in your company here. Such a pleasure that we may pursue uh, questions and curiosities that you may have about this special day, election day. This is who we are. This is what we show the rest of the world, a free people having that opportunity to engage the inherent right of self-government, one that we believe in as the foundation uh, of our Declaration of American Independence, purporting those inherent rights that are given to everyone across the globe, let alone ourselves. Well, I, I am getting carried away now with uh, with our principles to which I will return uh, throughout our conversation. But I want to hear your questions. So, Ms. Boyer, if you will kindly provide the questions of our, of our visitors. Certainly. So, at what age did you first cast a vote for a public official? Well, I could not cast a vote until I approached my majority, and that is 21 years of age. For me, that was in the year 1764. Oh, I was already familiar with the process of casting a vote. Uh, that was, of course, for members of the Virginia House of Burgesses. A uh, reason simply because my own father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, uh, stood for that election as a member of the old Virginia House of Burgesses. I was, believe it was sometime 1754 and 1757. I was upwards of 11 years of age. 11, 12, 13 years of age at that time, and he was successful. Uh, he was a member of the old Virginia House of Burgesses. But when I approached my majority, 17 in 64, my father lamentably no longer alive, uh, I finally came into the administration of my father's freeholdings, but only to a particular extent, because my father left his freeholdings unto my mother. And she held those rights until she passed away, lamentably, the last day of March, 1776. But that did not uh, prevent me from casting a vote since I had been the eldest son of my father and therefore not only inherited my father's estate, but also inherited uh, that right of a freeholder to vote. You see, the only one who could vote uh, before the American Revolution throughout all of the colonies, let alone Virginia, was the white male freeholder. Freeholding meaning you owned outright all of your property, and I think you already know uh, not only the land, but those families that lived upon it if you were a holder of enslaved individuals. 
So that was part of the freeholding into which I then uh, came into the right to vote. Uh, that was um, 17 and 64. If I remember, he who was um, standing for the House of Burgesses and representation of Albemarle County, uh, where of course I still live, was the son of my father's good friend. My father's good friend was Colonel Joshua Fry. Uh, and he died about 17 and 55. His son was Henry Fry. The Fry's lived down at Viewmont, a Viewmont plantation on the road down to Scottsville, uh, south of, of Monticello. And so uh, Henry Fry uh, stood for that office of Burgess, that first vote that I placed in 17 and 64. And by the way, he was successful. Next question. So how were public elections conducted by subjects of the British monarchy when Virginia and all the other colonies were still governed by Great Britain? Well, remember, as I said, uh, it was only the white male freeholder who had the vote. And so therefore, when we were under the British monarchy, all of us considered subjects of that monarchy, even though we had the right of representation uh, in placing a vote and being elected to office at the same time, that right was still, if you will, overseen by the royal prerogative. So how did we vote? My earliest recollections in attending to the ballot box when a young boy and accompanying my father uh, was down at the courthouse uh, here in Charlottesville. Uh, all the white male freeholders would assemble there at the courthouse. This being offered in abundance. Oh, yes. And those who were invited to stand for office and anyone who could, if they felt they had the respect of the community, uh, would provide more and more of this to your particular liking if you could perhaps be swayed by them. And that is how they considered the persuasion to be gained. Then you would stand before the magistrate, the chief magistrate there, justice of the peace, and you would first and foremost swear your allegiance to the monarch and to the kingdom of Great Britain and pronounce boldly the individual for whom you were voting. Yes, you had to announce the name of the individual uh, for whom you were placing your vote. <laughs> you can imagine, many people knew then if they had any question otherwise, where you stood on your politics. So that is what I remember from my youth. That is what I remember uh, continuing well through the revolution and beyond. Uh, to make mention of the name of your candidate for office. So moving ahead a little bit in time, when and why did you first announce that you were a candidate for public office? Well, I, I do not, I would not say that I publicly announced. Uh, I was invited. Uh, those you would call the candidates for public office were those white male freeholders who were invited by their community of farmers uh, to stand in their representation. Uh, you would never go out and boldly announce, I am a candidate, I am standing on your behalf. No, no, no. That would be considered a bit too vain. No, you would be invited as a proper representative of those who, who had faith and trust in what you could do to protect them and their property. Uh, under the civil authority. Uh, first, of course, a civil authority under the monarchy of Great Britain, then afterwards in our revolution, the civil authority of a government of, by, and for the people. That is what you might say. And yes, I verily believe in that. But again, it's government of and for and by the white male freeholder uh, as we began. So once more, you would never want anyone to think that you were so vain that you would stand for office and say, I am the only one who, who must receive your vote. No, no, you have to incur the trust. Now, here's an interesting thing relevant to the trust of a farming community. And that is the fact that the community could always depend upon your word. You gave your word. This was most important for creditors, let alone your neighboring farmer, your neighboring farmer depending upon you to have certain crops uh, or even spirits to offer 
when they may be at a, a lack of that crop or, or a lack of their distilling, that you would have that to back them up. And your creditors, most important, though they knew they would never receive everything from you, impressing their claims, they would always be guaranteed to receive something from you. They had your word. And, and that was the, the honesty. That was, uh, if you will, the, the virtue of a farming community, that understanding of your word, the person you could trust, and that person never to presume that they were above another in representing all of the community. So what about campaigning? Did you have to do much campaigning? You talked about not announcing it, but did you campaign to assure that you might win the election? Campaigning, good heavens, you're referring to something that could be looked upon as using military tactics, as if you are going into electioneering as pursuing a battle upon a battleground. What would things be coming to if we were to resort solely to that idea of electioneering? Let the people make up their mind for those they consider uh, are the ones they can trust. There's no such thing as campaign, campaigning. Uh, arguments and debates before the public would be considered rather ungentlemen. Uh, there are debates, yes, upon particular political platforms, but as I have always known them, uh, those debates take place in the legislative bodies. As I had opportunity to observe as a young man, when a member of the old Virginia House of Burgesses, that same body of which my father served. Oh, he would come back home here at Shadwell where we were living uh, after spending weeks in Williamsburg when the government would call, be called there. And he would regale us with the stories of the arguments and debates that he bore witness to in the old House of Burgesses. So it was within the, le the, the legislative bodies that any sort of campaigning in debate or argument uh, would be held. Uh, even now, as I know, the, the senators uh, of our nation representing all of our states, uh, their votes, their campaigning, if you will, uh, their uh, uh, arguments take place in the state legislatures. And as it is the state legislature that elects those senators for all of the states. So I'm, I'm somewhat cautious in hearing the word campaigning uh, as if this becomes some fervent act of doing battle amongst your candidates. Um, good heavens, what might that stir up in a people uh, were they to forget the respect they ought to hold uh, for their candidates? Well, Chester would like to know when they switch to secret ballots in elections. Well, Chester, I, I would not say that there was any immediate switch I would say that it began to happen gradually. And it began to happen after uh, the American Revolution uh, and our victory, and then gradually so, to my knowledge, in each of the various states and commonwealths. I believe more so it began in England. And the reason I say that is because I had the opportunity, so did Mr. Madison, when we visited uh, the New England states, that was on our trip through the Northern Lakes uh, back in the spring of 1791 to visit the New England town meeting. As I have said, one of the purest forms of democracy in our nation because the entire town folk come out uh, to the location, usually within a courthouse, and there they open up to questions, their concerns within their community. They pepper, if you will, certain candidates for office with their questions and concerns. And then when it comes to the time of electioneering to cast your vote, well then there, that vote is secretive uh, unto the voter to place the, the candidate's name on a paper and place it within a ballot box. So that is you begin to see the ballot box uh, take hold, not only through New England, but then through the rest of our states where no longer should publicly appearing and proclaiming one candidate's name over any other would, uh, well, create a bias, if you will, within the community as to whom you were in favor of. So I would think gradually that ballot box and the secret ballot that you could place within that box uh, finally has taken hold, certainly uh, by this year. 
So it's been said that Patrick Henry was elected the first, was the first elected governor of the new Commonwealth of Virginia. And so we're past, um, oh, sorry, let me go back. And you were elected the second governor. Yes. But you were not Henry's first choice to succeed him. Is that true? Well, you didn't need to go back. That's what I thought you were, were venturing towards, <laughs> reminding me, yes, I was the second governor of our new Commonwealth of Virginia. Henry, unquestionably, he would be the first to tell you, was the first elected governor of our Commonwealth. And so as you went back, you are asking, as it has been said, I was not his first choice to secede him, whether that is true. Yes, it is true. That, that is absolutely correct. Why? I wish I could say concerns of policy, uh, concerns, if you will, of heated argument and debate within the civil authority, but I, I think it is more, more so as I grow older. Simply our personalities. Simply our personalities. Now, were there policy differences? Yes, there were. And that began as the revolution began. And remember, before the revolution and even during the majority of the revolution, uh, Colonel Patrick Henry and I worked together. We worked together in founding those principles of our new nation, let alone our commonwealth. But I think as the revolution progressed uh, and the concerns of providing safety and defense of our new commonwealth, something that Colonel Henry had been concerned about at the very beginning of the war, war and no less Colonel Thomas Jefferson. Yes, I was Lieutenant Colonel of Virginia Militia, but it became a different situation as the war progressed to see that Virginia now became a center, a theater of our American revolution. And as a consequence, whether Colonel Thomas Jefferson would be as, um, would be as successful as Colonel Patrick Henry had been to preserve, protect, and defend our commonwealth. I think Henry knew and many others knew as the war was coming upon our homeland here in Virginia coming down from New England, coming up from North Carolina, that many of our Virginia militias, those that we had depended upon at the outbreak of the war, were now considering the war to be long and weary, almost interminable. And so many went back to their farms. They went back to, to work on their farms, to cultivate their farms. And as I have written, taking over that gavel, as Chief Magistrate of the new Commonwealth of Virginia, our Virginia militias were appearing and disappearing with the seasons and the crops. Now, furthermore, yes, Colonel Henry and I differed in political policy. Uh, I still remained in favor of the united effort of all of the states and commonwealths together. Uh, I have certainly an allegiance to Virginia, but never to consider Virginia soul and unto herself, regardless of the rest of the nation. Uh, Henry became more concerned that the, the rest of the nation would ultimately overpower uh, the influence of Virginia. And yes, that would be so, but we are a union. 13 individual nations together, e pluribus unum, working on behalf of the whole, one for all and all for one, uh, as D'Artagnan would say. Uh, and then, too, there was the policy of the separation between the civil authority and the ecclesiastical authorities. I'm referring, of course, directly to what became the statute of Virginia for religious freedom. Henry was opposed to that at the very, very beginning. As I was drafting that bill for religious freedom, he began to oppose it with what he called his bill of assessment suggesting that we cannot distinctly separate civil authority and, uh, and ecclesiastical authority, that there still should continue a tax and assessment, if you will, on behalf of state religion. No, no, that would be going backward instead of forward. Remember, we were governed by the Church of England as we had been governed uh, by their monarchy. And so therefore, severing our ties with the monarchy of England, we severed our ties as well with the Church of England. And here finally, upon this tabula verasa, in America, let alone Virginia, there could be pure freedom for religion. So those two concerns, I think the, 
the influence of the new Commonwealth of Virginia in contrast with the influence of our entire union of all of the states and commonwealths, as well as that separation between church and state came into uh, our collaborations, the collaborations between Colonel Patrick Henry and myself and began to divide us. And so as a consequence, yes, I will readily admit I was not Henry's first choice to secede him. So skipping ahead a little bit again, um, Maureen is asking about um, your running against Adams for the presidency, your once good friend. Could you speak a little bit about when you were vice president under Adams? And uh, Yes, well, Maureen, you, you must be in collusion with Chester, are you not, to bring up old concerns and, uh, and heartbreaks uh, during my lifetime in political service. Um, Maureen, firstly, may I say what, uh, what I find curious is that you use the term running against or running for office. Maureen, why would anyone want to run for it? As I said earlier, we're invited to stand for office, stand as a candidate, let the people make the choice. Uh, and yet, yet, perhaps I should have simply run away from that contest that greeted both, both Vice President Adams and me uh, in 1796. I believe that is what you are referring to. Uh, that was the first time I was invited to stand for the office of president of our new nation. I had been retired. i have been retired for over three years after having resigned as Secretary uh, of State. And that is a whole nother quandary, I dare say, in which I found myself uh, in contention with our former Secretary of the Treasury, General Alexander Hamilton. But here, as if I needed this contention with my old friend, my fellow collaborator on our Declaration of American Independence, who had been elected the first vice president of our nation in the very first presidential election under our Constitution, to be invited and called in those many years later. Uh, they were, what, eight years later. Uh, when many believed that the vice president should immediately secede the president and continue on uh, the concerns and policies of that previous president. Here I am invited in, yes, to contend, to be the opposer to Vice President Adams. And Maureen, I know you realize, for history will never doubt it, uh, I lost. I lost, and uh, I'm presuming, Maureen, you know as well that our Constitution was written, whoever receives the second highest number of votes then becomes vice president. Mercy, if there were ever a, a problem or a fault in our Constitution, at the very beginning, that was certainly it. Uh, to think the two individuals contending with one and the other are seeking the public support and one should ultimately succumb to the other must then ally themselves with the other? It's simply in opposition to human nature itself. And thank heaven it was rectified. Uh, the 12th Amendment certainly rectified that. And we had our first vice presidential election. But that would not happen until another, what, uh, another uh, eight years. Uh, I bet it's close to that. And so there it is, Maureen. I, had, I succumbed and I had to suffer. Well, I did. I had to suffer the office of vice president for four years. In fact, I wrote, the mind of man never came up with a more inconceivable office than that of vice president. I hardly had anything to do. I presided over the Senate, but I spent most of my time here at Monticello in a good read. So you were finally elected our nation's third president then in 1800. Um... <laughs> well, you could say finally. <laughs> You could say finally, yes, yes, I was finally uh, elected president and I, I did become the, the third president of our new nation under the constitution. That is something we must bear in mind. There were presidents of our Congress uh, before our national constitution. There were many of them, uh, but they were merely presidents of the Congress. It was under our constitution once ratified uh, that we elected our first president of the nation. Uh, many refer to him still as His Excellency, uh, General Washington. And then to be followed uh, by the individual to whom I succumbed in 1796, our second president, John Adams. 
And I think with respect to finally being elected the third president, I can say I was not a silent vice president. I, I freely voiced my opinion, wrote my opinion. The newspapers in our nation were rife with political contests, uh, taking the different political platforms, those who had become Federalist and those who were known as anti-Federalist or Democratic or Republicans. And um, yes, uh, there were heresies, twistifications of the facts hurled against us. But President and I, Adams and I were not alone. Now, those platforms were divided by others. The Federalist platform was divided by a, a Southern Federalist, General Charles Coltsworth Pinckney from South Carolina. Uh, my anti-Federalist platform was divided by a, well, a former Federalist from New York. He saw a political opportunity for himself. He changed his code. He became a renegade. I believe you know to whom I am referring. Aaron Burr, by the way, Citizens, do you know that Colonel Burr, Colonel Aaron Burr, came to visit me here at Al Monticello? That was 1798. I knew what he was here for. Many had already ascertained a notion that he would be standing for the high office of president someday soon. So as I wrote my daughter, Colonel Burr left before dinner over a difference of opinion. He was here to read me out. And so it is, he stood to, to split the anti-federalist platform. I'm happy to say that I received the popular vote and I wish we could end right there. No, it had to be decided by that contrivance of the electoral system. And you don't want to get me started on that electoral college. It's a contrivance, a contrivance on behalf of men of property, on behalf of the white male freeholder to preserve, protect, and defend his property, uh, particularly to uphold in our Constitution something that I hope may be abolished someday, and that is the three-fifths clause, three-fifths of an individual to support the property of a white male freeholder, and the fear uh, of those property owners, of an uneducated mob of individuals. And, and so there, that's why I've said the electoral system does not properly announce the voice of the people, and someday it is going to become a blot on our Constitution, which will make its hit. That's right, like an ink blot upon a paper. And uh, therefore, what if we, and I hope, though I may never see the day, end this abominable commerce of slavery, the enslaving of our fellow man, allow all individuals to hold the reins of self-government, that inherent right, which is the promise of our nation in our declaration, our inherent rights given to us by nature and nature's God, the inherent right of equal and exact justice. So if that becomes our, our providence someday, ending the enslaving of our fellow man, providing a system of education for all people, that they might understand what it is to hold the reins of self-government, to understand what it is to be a citizen and to place a well-educated vote for those to whom they desire to entrust the reins of government. And someone convinced me what is the further need of an electoral system. So that is what came into play. It was a stalemate. 73 electoral votes each for Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. And for many weeks, our nation did not know who would be the next president. The result of a political campaigning, you might say, just as you mentioned earlier, all of the, the heresies, the name calling, hurled amongst four candidates, all of the twistifications of the facts appearing in our newspapers. Oh, thank heaven. I hope we never see anything like it again. So Don has a question and he would like to know how long did it take for you to hear word of the final vote of your election? Oh, that's a very good question. You mean to hear the final vote uh, of, for, of the, uh, the um, final opinion and the vote in, the, uh, in the, the House of Representatives? That's what I'm drawing to because that is how the, uh, the presidential election of 1800 was finally settled. Uh, through the Electoral College and that impasse of, uh, of the same uh, electoral votes, 73 for 
verse 73 for me, as our constitution says, with that occurs, then it must go into the house. And it did, it went into the house and the house then began to caucus and vote to break that tie. And it took quite a number of votes, upwards of about 30 or more to finally break the tie. How long was it then before the rest of the nation knew that I would be the successor? Well, it would hit new immediately in Washington City where that vote was finally broken and decided. That went out just by, uh, well, news writers and the, and the numbers beginning to place this information in the articles in their newspapers in Washington City. And so that spread throughout our nation. So you're talking within the close proximities of Washington City within a day or two, farther out within 100, 200, 300 miles or within a week, and then farther out across the country to the west or up far in New England or down south. Uh, well, it would take uh, several weeks before the nation finally knew uh, who uh, had been the successor. And then remember, within that time, because the tie was broken in the presidential election of 1800, on February 17th, 1801, February 17th, and when it was known that I would be the third president. Well, think, within but a few weeks, March the 4th, 1801, I would then take the oath of office. The oath of office, March the 4th, 1801, there in the old Senate chamber, chamber in our Capitol building, our Capitol was as yet unfinished. So just a few weeks later, before many people knew who had succeeded in that presidential election, uh, I took the oath of office as our nation's third president. Remember, I live, I live still in a four mile an hour world. I know of no place upon the globe where you can travel any faster than a ship at sea or a horse on land. So you touched on this a little bit earlier, but Rose Ann had asked if you might foresee a time when women might be granted the right to vote. And you talked a little bit about enslaved people, but what about those who have not had the chance to vote? Um, do you foresee that happening in the future? Roseanne, that is such a wonderful question to hear. I'm happy so many people are able to hear it. All of you who are visiting us here today and may continue to resonate this question because that is who we are, to foresee when this particular privilege that not, I know only to be held in the hands of the white male freeholder may become the universal privilege of every individual, not only in our nation, but across the globe. That is our promise. That is universal suffrage. Is, is, it is interesting to think that even now in this year, we are still beholden to old British habits, British customs, and British laws, narrowing the franchise in our democratical republic, that is how I refer to us, that limiting the franchise only in the hands of the white male freeholder. Could it be that, that soon our women folk will have a, a vote? Yes, I, I foresee that. Yes, that will come, that will come to pass particularly those who are held in the barbarous bonds of slavery, that, that someday they may have a vote? Yes, there is nothing more assuredly written in the book of faith than these people ought to be free, and that as well, their birthright to hold the reins of self-government. This is the birthright of man across the globe, those inalienable rights given to man, not by any government, not by any ruler, the rights given to man by nature and nature's God. Remember, Governments only provide privileges. And the only purpose of any government and its laws, as I have written and Dr. Franklin and many others, is simply to protect people from injury by one and the other. If we continue as a new nation with the eyes of the world upon us to allow only the white male freeholder to cast a vote, is that not concurrently then an injury unto those who have no voice? in the manner to which they may place a vote for those to protect and defend them? I think indeed uh, this will become a universal franchise in our nation. And I'm hopeful as the eyes of the world uh, remain upon us as to whether the American experiment in self-government will succeed, that we will show them and show them, I hope in no time too far off. 
So in 1809, you retired after 40 years of public service. I know a lot changed in public elections during that time. And Adam asks, how would you encourage all citizens to exercise their right to vote? That is a wonderful question, Adam. And I believe that how a citizen or an individual exercises their rights, particularly for what I hope will be universal suffrage, is what you are doing right now, Adam, by asking the question, putting it forth for all of us to ponder and, and to think back on, on our founding principles and to, to revel and marvel in the fact that we're the first nation in the history of man founded upon principle not upon monarchy, not upon royalty, nobility, aristocracy, landed gentry. Adam, I know you know this, and I hope we all do. And never forget, that is why we fought the American Revolution. That is why we shed our blood. It was not easy. No more than the work that still lies ahead of us, Adam, so that people will continue to speak out upon injustices, or speak out for that opportunity to be properly represented their opinions heard, their concerns heard for everything that can better our nation and lift us up as a people. That is the purpose of self-government, to improve upon conditions as they are and to make them better. I like the way, Adam, you use the, the term citizen. Is that not the essence of it? And what you're doing in asking questions, which is very simply from time immemorial, Socratic commentary, open and free inquiry as Socrates engaged with his students under the shade of the trees in his garden. No question unworthy to be asked. That begins and provides the education for citizenship. Thank you, Adam. So some final thoughts here. Um, what advice might you provide for anyone who's contemplating pursuing public service. What advice would I give? Well, I, I've shared a lot of what I have written down and with a choice of words that I, I hope uh, makes it the clearer and the more comprehensible for us to understand what lies ahead of us, the further work that is to be done. I would say that the first and foremost suggestion to anyone pondering public service is to realize that our system of government and laws is founded on the evolution of law through successive generations, their own particular experiences that they bring that can help lift all of us to live a better life and to be ourselves, each and every one, of service to another. You know, it has been well known from time in memoriam, the earth belongs to the living generation. The dead have no power over us, they're gone. And think of this as well, no one has ever lived in the past. Perhaps you have read, as I have written, a child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40. Our laws and our institutions grow as we grow as a people. So to continue to ponder this, to continue to voice these questions and concerns, to continue to engage what are in our Bill of Rights, in that very First Amendment, free assembly, gather together, discuss uh, ideas and challenges. Uh, trial by juries of um, impartially se uh, selected, pursue that. Recognize and stand staunchly that Congress must never make a law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Standing staunchly to protect freedom of the press. This is so essential. Maybe some of you have read, as I have written, where it left to me to decide whether we should have this nation with a government and no newspapers, or have this nation with newspapers and no government. I should not hesitate a moment but to accept the latter. After all, who must be informed? Who must make up their own minds to what they read in the newspapers? And consider yourself not to feel so satisfied by reading only one newspaper which you choose to read, but to read the opposite opinion in another newspaper. And again, then to make up your own mind for what is best for everyone. Standing upon these principles that are written down clearly, not only in our Declaration of American Independence, 
but in that which President Washington referred to as the guarantee of our declaration, our constitution. Read our constitution. There within the 20 minutes it will take you to read our declaration, the half of an hour it will take you to read our constitution with the 12 amendments as I know it, well then imagine within but one hour you've already equipped yourself with the education for citizenship. And to stand on behalf of the people as new experiences and, and new laws come in to provide a more universal franchise, well then you will best understand what the people desire of you and look upon you with their faith and trust in what you can do for them. And I would add one more thing. I wrote this to, uh, to my grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph. He was considering to stand for public office. And I said, Jeff, never ever do in private what you would not do in public. That does not mean you will not have spears hurled against you, arrows of heresy shot at you. Yes, that I'm afraid you will have to suffer as everyone will standing for public office. But the point of the matter is you will sleep soundly. You will understand the element of true virtue and therefore you may stand boldly with the people hoping they will trust you as you will have a trust for them. I know at times John Adams has said, well, I'm cautious of the people, I'm cautious of the people, and I understand that, yes, but John Adams knows that I continue with growing faith in the people. Yes, I do believe that. When you think as the Quakers do, that each and every one of us are created in the image of our creator, well, does that not incur in itself a faith in our fellow man? So I, I leave you with these suggestions and I leave you with the fact that simply as an American, public service is our duty to each and every one. Simply as an American, politicking, discussing our politics and looking forward to that day when we may place a vote as the example of truly holding the reins of self-government. That's why I assure you, I believe much more in the dreams of the future, better than in the history of the past. I placed my vote this morning. There it is. That signifies my citizenship. And I did not bring Bumbo to the polls. No, rather, I brought a cup of coffee, which I considered the drink of the civilized world. The reason? I wanted to have my wits about me when I placed my vote. Until we meet again, I remain your humble and obedient servant.